Lukewarm Christians, power over sin and adoption into God's family. Lots to talk about today. Let's get into it. Welcome to The Pursuit, a Crosspoint City Church podcast that pursues a deeper dive into the scripture from last week's sermon. I am Will Goodwin, our Central Ministries pastor here at Crosspoint City, and I'm here with our lead pastor, James Griffin. How you doing? I'm good, man. Great to see you again. Good to see you too. Yeah, man. Gearing up for Easter. Are you excited? Uh, it's a busy week, yeah. It is a it's, busy week. It's going to be the biggest Easter that we've ever had in the history of our church. It's crazy. I was telling somebody yesterday, 13 gatherings including all of our Good Friday gatherings. That's incredible. So we have six here in Cartersville, two in Adairsville, two in Rome, plus Good Friday. We're going to have another worship venue set up here in Cartersville too. Hush, hush. That's a secret. Don't tell anybody. So potentially more gatherings than than 13. Oh, yeah, so, I guess if you can, yeah, if you count those as like, like that's lo- right. the mini location. So we're going to see what happens, <laughs> but, but uh, just believing and praying that God moves in a big way. Yeah. I know it's a lot on your team. Hey, listen, but we, I mean, we prepare for it. Yeah, The cliche right. is to call it like the Super Bowl of Sundays, <laughs> but every Sunday is the, the Super Bowl of Sundays. <laughs> like, uh, listen, Jesus is alive every Sunday we exactly meet, right. isn't he? That's, that's right. That's exactly right. We're supposed to talk about this every week, right? That's this right. is what we're doing. All right. Well, let's talk about this week. Okay. All right. Because All right. you taught on John 8. I did. Right. Jesus is uh, at the Festival of the Booths. He tells the crowd that who... Whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. Very right. popular Christian song lyric, right? Yeah. The last <laughs> Give us a quick summary of the sermon uh, for those who might have missed it. Would love to, man. Yeah, the topic was freedom. And the point that I made throughout the sermon is that freedom is not you doing what you want to do. Freedom is you living how you're meant to live. And Jesus talks in the text about how his truth or his teachings, what they do is they align us with the way we're meant to live. And ultimately, when we abide in that truth, it results in our freedom. And so he's talking, this is the scene, he's talking to a group of Jews who had believed. You know, he made this announcement at the Feast of Booths that he is the light of the world. We're told that people believed in him. And so he's telling the people who believed how to know if their belief is genuine. I made the comment in the sermon, we all know the person who says they believe, but they don't act like they believe, Mm. you know? Uh, It's the person who prayed a prayer at eight years old to stay out of hell. They've been living like hell ever since. Mm. And that is not belief, okay? That's fire insurance. That's exactly what it is, (laughs) man. You use Jesus to avoid suffering, but I'm not going to follow him. So unbiblical. But, But Jesus, the test of belief is this. He said, true belief will lead to abiding. Your believing will lead to abiding. And the way that he says it is that if you abide in my word, you're my disciples, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Mm. And the group of people that he says this to are very, very offended because they think they're free. I mean, it's Mm. comical. They're like, Jesus, we've never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say we'll be free? And uh, he goes on to explain that the freedom we all need is ultimately freedom from sin. And Jesus is the only one who can free us from sin because Jesus never sold out to sin. And uh, Mm, you and I can't do it. You know, we can't free ourselves from the slavery to to sin. We can't make ourselves part of the family of God. And so the danger, as I explained, in failing to see ourselves as slaves to sin is that we miss out on what Jesus offers. If you think you're free, but you're not free, you're never going to turn in faith to the one who can set you free. And so you remain in bondage to sin, and you're never a part of God's family. And there are major, major implications uh, of that. And so we wrapped up the sermon by talking about fathers and how we all have a spiritual father. It's either God or the devil, and there's an easy way to know which one you belong to. If, if your desire is to do what God desires, he's your father. And if you have no desire to do what God desires, then the devil is your father. Such a good word. And Jesus, man, he just, he, he unpacks who the devil is. He is a murderer. He is a liar. That his number one goal in life is to spread death. And the way that he spreads death is through deception. He lies to us to kill us, to steal from us, to rob from us. It's just a really strong passage. And, you know, I, I talked to several people after the sermon over the weekend who were thanking me and already talking about who they're going to send this to. And it's one of those sermons that everybody needs to hear. Yeah. Not because I preached it, but because Jesus did. Okay. And so I would just say, if, if you missed it, go back, watch it, listen to it, share it, man, the freedom that Jesus talked about is a freedom that we all need. Yeah. It's so true. My wife and I were talking about watching it again. It was that good. Mm, Love that. Yeah. 
All right. Well, there's a... Uh, I mean, we'll come back to abiding in John 15. Yeah, so yeah. looking at it now, when John says believing will lead to abiding, yeah, how can someone who feels like sin's a constant struggle, right? Mm-hmm. That's a, it's a losing battle. Or that, okay. that sometimes they, they, they fail. They know they've messed up, and they know they haven't honored God. Right? How, do they, how can they know then that they're saved? Yeah. Well, I will say the struggle is real. Yeah. It, it's real. And... And it is a constant struggle. I mean, I talked about this on a podcast recently, this ongoing battle between the flesh and the spirit, okay? Um, Man, if you know Jesus Christ, the spirit of God lives in you. He was sent by Jesus to indwell you and to empower you to live the life God created you to live. But at the same time, there's still part of you that is broken. It is called your flesh. And it's the part of you that is constantly dragging you away from God and towards sin And the spirit is trying to do the opposite. He's trying to drag you away from sin and toward God. And so, man, we we all as believers in Christ feel that tension. We have to live in that tension. I remember years ago, I was was hanging out at like a barbecue with some friends. I think it was like Memorial Day, Labor Day or something like that. And at the time, I was working really, really hard to clean up my diet because I had not been so good about food. And and I just resolved, I'm eating clean. I'm staying away from sweets. I'm not going to eat sugar. I'm just drinking water. So we show up to this party, this barbecue, and a buddy of mine brought this amazing chocolate cake. All right. It was, I mean, it was just staring me down, like tempting me. And I felt the tension, the struggle of like, mm. this is what I want to do, but I really want to eat that. This is what I've resolved to do, but that is very, very tempting and I was living in this tension. I'll be honest and confess, I ate a piece of that cake, man, like I did. It's like, it's, it's Memorial Day, it's Labor Day. Why not have a piece of cake? But, but it's a similar tension just on a spiritual level between sin and the spirit, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like we all know what we need to do and we know what we want to do, but there's a part of us that's trying to persuade us to do the thing we don't need to do, right? And so this is that struggle between flesh and spirit. And so I would say that struggle is a sign that you're saved. Yeah. Okay. If you weren't struggling, I would be concerned that you're not saved. Mm. So if you're fine with sin, if you're fine with giving in to temptation, like now I'm just going to do what the flesh wants me to do. Mm. Ooh, man. Well, that's dangerous. And I would ask, well, why, why would you be confident in your salvation if that's the case? If the spirit of God is not at work in your life, dragging you in the opposite direction, then what evidence is there to show or prove that you have been saved? But the fact, again, that that you're living in this place of tension and you can feel what the flesh wants and you can feel what the spirit wants and you're battling with that, I would say that is a good indication that the spirit of God is at work in your life. And the only reason he's at work in your life is because you belong to Jesus Christ. You have been saved, okay? Um, Anything you want to add before I keep going, bro? No, no, keep going. Okay, I'll keep going. Okay, another way to know. Another way to know. I've often talked about salvation as past, present, and future tense. Yeah, right. Right, in in the scriptures, the, the words that are used, justification, sanctification, glorification. So justification is past tense. We have been saved. Sanctification is present tense. We are being saved. Glorification is future tense. We will be saved. Mm. So justification happens in a moment. This is when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and God forgives you of all of your sin, past, present, and future, declares that you are not guilty, makes you righteous. Again, it's it's a one-time event, okay? Glorification is similar. It's a one-time event. Happens in a moment. And it happens in that moment when you see Jesus Christ face to face as Savior and Lord. Uh, You are rescued out of sin and the consequences of sin forever. You're glorified, and so you're changed into the image and likeness of Christ. And and you receive a new body that's like his body. We're going to talk about that at Easter. That all happens in a moment, okay? Sanctification is a process that happens between those two moments. And so sanctification, again, is is us being saved, present tense. I think the mistake that so many people make is that they fail to see the struggle of sanctification as present salvation. Mm. All right? That's good. So so just like the person, let me go back to this guy, who would say, no, 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 man, I prayed a prayer to stay out of hell at eight years old, but he's been living like hell ever since. 
and he's not experiencing any type of present salvation. So the spirit of God is not at work. The spirit of God is, is not changing him and transforming him more into the image and likeness of Christ. But he's looking back on a past event and he's just resting in that. That's a mistake. But I think, again, the person who is struggling right now, the mistake they can make is to go, well, the struggle means I'm not saved. The struggle of sanctification must mean that I'm not saved. And I'm just saying, no, the struggle of sanctification means that you are being saved. <laughs> that, that the Holy Spirit of God is confronting you on a daily basis with your own sinfulness and depravity. Mm. That he is bringing into the light those broken places in you that are still in need of repair, still in rene- need of renewal. And he is doing something to change you. And at times that is painful. And at times it's hard and at times it hurts, but I would say that you should rest in what the spirit is doing in your life as evidence that you are being saved. And so I would just ask the person who asked this question, are you being saved? How do I know that I am? I would ask, are you, are you being saved? Another way I would ask it is there progress being made in your life toward greater Christ-likeness? Mm. So can you look back like a year ago or two years ago and five years ago and see a difference between where you used to be and where you are now? I know that there's still stuff there and, and none of us are perfect. And the thing that's frustrating about sanctification is that it is lifelong. So we're all going to be struggling for a minute, okay, mm. until we see Jesus Christ face to face. But if you truly belong to Jesus, you should at least see progress as you proceed through that process. So the question I would ask is, are you being saved? Is the spirit at work in your life? And if he is, then rest in that. That's good. Well, I think because saved is past tense. Yeah. People hold on to that. Right. Right. And we could dig into this and it's probably not the time to do this, but even thinking about when you think about the past, present, future aspects of salvation, mm-hmm. you, you really get into the eternal aspect of salvation because yeah. that's how God sees it. And yeah, we right. use past, present, and future in a very linear sense because we it's do. how we understand reality. Yep. You know, whereas but God is like the names written in the book of life before the beginning of time. Like it like he, there is no time for right, him. Right. It's it's done. Right. Yep. And and because we have used that term it, it, it it, that you're saved. Are you saved? Or using that past tense term, it's like, well, yeah, I checked the box. Yeah. I went down forward. You know, I did the fire insurance thing. Right. So I'm saved. But yeah. then they wrestle with, well, I don't know because I sin or I struggle with this or how do I know? And the conviction thing, I think, is so important for people to, to remember. And I was looking up, so I was trying to find it because I, I can't remember who it was. I was trying to find it. I think it's D.A. Carson. Okay. Because he was asked, like, how how can you have assurance of salvation? And if, if it's not D.A. Carson, I'm, for, I'm messing that up. Somebody can look it up and correct me later. But he, he, he said, there's three questions. He says, he says, well, do you love Jesus the way that you ought to? Mm-hmm. No. Okay. Well, do you love Jesus the way he deserves to be loved? <laughs> no. Well, do you even love Jesus at all? Yeah. Yes, I'm trying to. Then That's you're right. That's right. It's like because <laughs> only the Holy Spirit that. can lead you to want to love Jesus the way that you ought That's it. and the way that he deserves. And without that, you're completely lost. That's right. And you don't know that you need to yep. pursue righteousness and holiness. It's only through the Holy Spirit. So if that conviction conviction exists yep. and you hold on to that, right. Right. That that question of being saved, are you being saved? Mm-hmm. There's your assurance. That's right. That's so exactly good. it, man. I hope it helps. I had a seminary professor, I'll say this and then we can move on. I had a seminary professor who shared his story once with the class and and he was just confronting the idea that Man, to know that you're saved, you have to be able to point back to a time and a date and a place. And if you don't know the right. time and the date and Spiritual the place, yeah. right, then, yeah. then you've never been saved. And he was like, that's garbage, mm-hmm. okay? And, and he shared his story. He said, I've grown up in the church. Uh, my parents brought me to church every single week. I grew up hearing the gospel. And he said, I cannot point to a time or a date or a place that it happened. He said, but I know that I'm saved. And his explanation is because I am being saved. Yes. Because the spirit of God's working in me and I have a desire to become more like Jesus and I want to follow him and I want to honor him and all that I say and do. And so if that is your heart and desire, rest in that, man. You're you're saved and you are being saved and one day you will be saved. Praise God. That's so good. So good. All right. Now, in your, I just want to dig into that more. We'll we'll, we'll move on. That's so good. Um, in the sermon, you talked about the parable of soil. That's that's not in 
uh, John. Right, right. Uh, but you refer to it from from Mark and Luke, I believe. Right? Yes, so, that's right. Um, the the hard, the the rocky soil, the thorny, uh, uh, the the of the the good plants, soil, yep, right? and then yep. the good soil. Yep. But the question uh, that that is being asked is, where do lukewarm Christians yeah. fit into that? Yeah, love this question, by the way. Uh, and I think that makes sense of it. Yeah, just we need to touch on the parable again, and then we need to define what a lukewarm Christian is, okay? Oh, yeah, okay. So just really, really quickly, the parable, and you can read it in Mark 4 and Luke 8, but Jesus basically uses these four different types of soil that you just named, Will, hard, rocky, thorny, and good soil, to describe different people and what they do when with the Word of God when it comes to them, Okay. Uh, the hard soil, this is the person that just rejects it. The uh, the rocky soil, this is the person who initially receives it, but then they fall away because life gets hard or persecution comes. Mm. The thorny soil is the person who receives it, and then it gets choked out, either by the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, which I know in America, we don't know none about that. Mm. And uh, the other thing is the desire for lesser things. So this is the preoccupied person, the person who is fine with having lesser things in the place of Christ. And then finally, the good soil, this is the person who receives the word and they're changed by the word. They receive it, they abide in it, and the word of God produces fruit in their life. And so let's talk about the lukewarm Christian. What is that? What is a lukewarm Christian? Well, this whole idea comes from the book of Revelation, okay? Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. I can tell you, you want to say something yeah, about Revelation. No, 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 that's it. I'm just kind of, <laughs> I was like, that's right. Yeah, that's it. Okay, that's okay, where it I comes was, from. Yeah. I didn't know what, what you were about to say, man. I got worried. Anytime you bring up Revelation and somebody wants to talk, you know, it's it's a little worrisome. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was going to bring up, too, last year I preached a series called Seven. And we talked about the seven churches right. found in the book of Revelation. Landstein. And I talked about this passage at length. So if, if you want to hear more, you can go find that sermon and listen to the sermon on uh, Laodicea. This yeah. is the church that Jesus uh, accuses of being lukewarm. But but what he tells them, and he's there's a lot of water stuff going on in the city as well that all plays into this. Yeah, it's yeah. brilliant. And uh, But he tells them that he wishes that they were hot or cold, but instead they're lukewarm. And I grew up here in that passage taught very wrongly that yeah. cold, that cold meant bad and that hot meant good. And so that Jesus is saying here, even that he would rather this church hate him than to love him in a lukewarm way. But that's not what he's saying. Okay. Right. Uh, cold and hot are both good things. Right. Like tea can be good, hot or cold. Um, coffee can be good hot or cold, depending upon who you are, you know, but, <laughs> but the lukewarm tea and the lukewarm coffee, like who wants that? Mm. You know, the, the tea and the coffee that's in the middle, nobody wants to drink that. And so Jesus says, because you're in the middle, I want to spit you out of my mouth. Uh, if you study the language, he's like, Hey man, because you're lukewarm, you make me want to vomit. And these are very, very strong words from Jesus. And so practically the lukewarm Christian would be this. This is someone who knows Christ, but is spiritually apathetic. They don't take their faith seriously. They're not living out the mission of Christ in his world. They're not striving to walk in obedience to God by the power of the Holy Spirit. I would say they're very inconsistent with church, with group, with prayer, with Bible reading. And when they do engage in those things, they're just kind of going through the motions. They're watching the clock. They're ready for it to be over. Uh, this is the person who's indifferent toward the poor and the suffering. They don't really serve. They don't really give. They forsake God's kingdom for the sake of their own kingdom. And they treasure the things of this world over Christ. Ultimately, according to him, a lukewarm Christian is a useless Christian which is really, really hard to think that someone who knows Christ could be unusable in the kingdom, uh, but this is the lukewarm Christian. Now, with all that said, the lukewarm Christian is also the Christian that Christ disciplines. And when you keep reading Revelation 3, you see it, all right? I love the heart of Jesus for his people. He says to this church, the reason that I'm telling you that you make me want to puke, it's because I love you. I want you to know, you make me want to vomit, and I'm telling you this because I love you and people that I love, I discipline. Mm. All right, we learn about the discipline of God from Hebrews chapter 12, and the writer of Hebrews, talk, uh, Hebrews talks about how God is a loving father who disciplines his kids, not to make them pay for what they've done, but to restore them back to a place of blessing. This is so important for people to know and to understand. If you belong to Christ and you are in Christ, 
God doesn't discipline you to make you pay for your sin because Christ already paid for your sin. There's nothing else for you to pay for. Mm. It was paid in full at the cross 2,000 years ago. When God disciplines you, he's working to restore you back to a place of blessing, okay? He's trying to restore you back to a place of fellowship. So it's like with my own kids, you know, and I'm sure it's the same with your kids. I discipline my kids out of love, and I'm not doing it just to make them pay, Mm. but I'm doing it to help them understand, like, what it means to be daughters in my family. Because when they're walking in disobedience to me as the father, I can't bless them. I can't give them freedom. I can't, I can't let the leash out a little bit further. You know what I mean? Like when kids are walking in disobedience, discipline is required so that they know how to act and live as part of the family in relationship to the father. And so this is why God disciplines his kids. And, and so I'll just go back to the parable and say this. Um, If you are doing what you want in life and there's no conviction and you are not experiencing the discipline of God, you are one of those first three soils. You're either the person who's heard the word and rejected it, or you're the person who at one point seemed to receive it, but it's either been choked out or you've fallen away for some reason. And I would say that is false discipleship, Mm. that you don't truly know Christ if that is you. Because if you know him and you fall away, if you know him and you fall into lukewarmness, to use the the language in the question, at some point he's going to come along and discipline you. And he's going to use his word to do it. And if you really know him, when the word comes to you, you're going to be like that good soil. And no matter how hard it might be to hear, you're going to receive the word and you're going to be changed by it. And so what what was the question? Where do lukewarm Christians fit in all this? Well, if you're really a Christian, you're the good soil. Yeah. And at some point out of love for you, God's going to do what he needs to do to make you hot or cold again. Mm. It's really good. And we're probably taking this analogy too far, but I, but I, I start a garden right? okay. I do it every year. And by the end of it, it's disgusting. But I, I know yeah. that the I think about the thorns and I think about these weeds that are thorny and they come and they just suck the life out of the place. Right. I'm actually trying to yeah. I'm trying to make the, you know, the good soil. And it looks like life. I mean, they're plants. It looks like something, but it's it's choking out yeah. what, I'm, what I'm really, truly trying to grow. That's right. And I think about like that pruning process is to create growth. Yeah, yeah. And it reminds me, because we were talking about abiding earlier, it reminds me in John 15 when he talks about this, because I didn't know this, and, and you read it, and you think about pruning, you're cutting off and the, you know, these dead branches to get cut, cut into the fire. Mm-hmm. But he's talking about the, 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 the vineyard and the vine and that grapefruit. But if you look at a vine, you're, you're, cutting, all, you're cutting even the fruit producing. Right, right. Because ultimately you want to produce better fruit. Yeah. And the pruning process is helping it grow better. Right. Including some of the branches that aren't growing at all. So like you're saying, there's a discipline even mm. towards those that are doing well mm-hmm. so that they do better. Right, right, right. Yep. Anyway. Yeah, it's God's commitment to us. I, I mean, I love what Paul says in uh, Philippians 1, that he who began a good work in us yeah. will see it through yeah, to good. completion, right? And so out of love, God will make sure that we become the people he wants us to be. And I, I just think that's amazing, man. Yeah. And it's painful at times and it's hard at times, but yeah. but he's going to see it through. I, that selfish component you're talking about, like if you're if there's no conviction, yeah, yeah. right? if you're not pursuing holiness, you're just pursuing self. I think about Matthew 7, uh, um, late in the chapter when Jesus is talking about not everybody who, who, yeah. cons- who says, Lord, Lord, right? Like there it's are a people terrifying are, passage. Right? Yeah. Because there are people who are doing the things they think are right, but ultimately in their heart, he knows their heart. It wasn't for me. Yeah. It yeah. was for you. Yeah. You say you're doing those things, but it's not for me. It's That's for right. your own it's for your own satisfaction. That's right. right. It's not for savior glorification. Anyway, mm. yeah. That's so good. Um all right. You also talked about how believers have this power over sin. Mm-hmm. And that's amazing. Yeah. How do we exercise a power over sin? Yeah. Well, I covered this in another podcast recently, and so I will just hit the highlights of what I covered and and add a couple of other thoughts in here as well. But this power over sin that I talked about in the sermon is available to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And, And again, what we have to understand about the Spirit, He is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity. He's not just some impersonal force or power but it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we are meant to walk in relationship with the Holy Spirit day by day. 
And so after the resurrection of Christ and after his ascension to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us and to empower us. And part of his ministry to to believers is he gives us power over sin. And Paul talks about it in Romans 8 at length, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. That's right. So we don't have any obligation to sin any longer. We don't have to say yes to sin, but we can put sin to death before sin kills us. And and so I would say a couple of things. Okay, number one, if you're going to exercise that power, you need an awareness of the Spirit's presence in your life. And I, I think, man, this is the mistake a lot of people make. And, and I grew up in a church that never really talked much about the Spirit. You know, I thought conquering sin was on me. Oh, mm. I, I've, I've just got to execute and exercise power over sin. I've just got to say no to sin. I know the things I shouldn't do. And so I just got to work hard not to do those things. And then I just did them all. <laughs> and then I found myself at the altar on Wednesday night at youth group feeling terrible and making empty promises to God. I'll never do that again. And like a week later, I'm doing it again Yeah, because it was all me. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. You ever, you ever find yourself there, man? Oh, every day. Okay. Yeah. But I feel like this is the mistake instead of walking through life with an awareness of the power that is available to them. So many people just walk in their own power. Right. And they fall and they fail and they're miserable and, you know, they're convicted or they feel guilty and they make promises to God and they just do it again and again and again and again and again because they don't even think about the fact that, wow, the spirit of God is, is in them and empowering them. But then secondly, and this is so big, we need to ask for his power each and every day, okay? So if we are going to exercise power over sin, we need to be aware of the presence of the Spirit in our lives. And then we actually need to ask for what he offers. I was thinking about a way to illustrate this, and this is the best I could come up with. It's kind of lame, but I think it'll make the point, okay? okay. So, uh, man, I'm, I, I love fitness. I love to work out. And there's a guy that I have followed for several years now. He's a like strong man, power lifter. His name Eddie Hall. He's just a monster. And in 2016, he set the world record for deadlift, okay? It was like 500 kilograms, whatever that is. I think it was like 1,100 plus pounds. Oh, some some crazy. A lot. Okay, yeah. I mean, he picked this thing up off the ground. His nose is bleeding. Oh, he 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 was put on a, he was put on a stretcher. Horrible. His heart rate was through, it was insanity. <laughs> it was absolute insanity. But but here's what I was thinking. Okay, like what if Eddie Hall somehow lived in me? Okay, just stay with me for a minute. Okay, okay. like what if the world record deadlifter lived in me? And I went to the gym this afternoon and we had deadlifts, you know, that was part of the workout. And uh, I decided, man, I want to try to deadlift 800 pounds. No, and I couldn't deadlift 800 pounds. And I stepped up to the bar and I just attempted that on my, on my own, by my own strength. But what if Eddie Hall lived in me and to pick that barbell up, all I needed to do was ask Eddie Hall who lived in me to pick it up for me. Hey, will you just take over in this moment and do it? And as long as I asked, dude, I could rip the barbell off the ground. That'd be pretty amazing if it were something like that, okay? Here's my point. I know, lame illustration, but here's my point. Dude, the spirit of God lives in you if you're a believer in Christ, Hmm. which means you have power over sin. And the problem for many people is that they step face-to-face with sin, and instead of asking the spirit of God in that moment, empower me. Give me what I need to kill this. They're just like, nah, I got it. I got it. It'd be like, again, Eddie Hall living in me and me stepping up to the barbell. I'm like, nah, I got it. Mm. I got it. I, I don't need you, bro. I got it. And then I fail. And I think this is why so many people fail who claim to know Christ. It's like the power is there. The, the person of the spirit is there. They have everything they need through him to conquer sin. And then they just don't ask. It's like, nah, I'll just, I'll try to beat porn on my own. I'll try to beat the addiction on my own. Yeah, whatever your thing is. Yeah. And then we fall, man. And it's so unfortunate and it is so unnecessary. And I think one of the reasons we do this is because we believe lies of the enemy. We talked about this in the sermon, right? The lies that he feeds us. And I think a lot of times we believe the lie that we got it, we can do it. You, you don't got it and you can't do it. And you need to own that about yourself. You are a weak person who desperately needs the spirit of God to be at work in your life. But then I also think that the enemy shames us and that prevents us from asking at times. 
like, hey, if that's what you want to do right now in this moment, the last thing you can go is uh, to do is ask for God or uh, go to God and ask for his help. And that's exactly what he wants us to do in moments of weakness and temptation. He wants us to go in those moments and ask for help. And so I would say if you want to ex- exercise power, that is what you do. You need to be aware of his presence. But part of that means you pray proactively and, and you just acknowledge what is true. Okay, Spirit of God, I know you live in me. Empower me today to walk in holiness and godliness. And then in moments of weakness and temptation, you pray and ask for what you need. And we all need to do this. That's good. I was just thinking about the talking about the cake earlier. Yeah. Um, you still thinking about that cake? I, well, unfortunately, <laughs> but just just that that there's an acknowledgement. Like you you said you 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 made a commitment. You were doing this thing, but then yeah. you ended up eating cake. And I know that's it's it's a silly thing to think about cake. No, yeah, it yeah. is whatever it is. It's pornography. It's, right. It's, whatever it is. It's alcohol. Whatever it is. And to 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 acknowledge it and say I need help now. Yep. And whether that is is and, and then just to trust in the Holy Spirit to say to speak it to someone mm-hmm. or to speak it out loud or to say whatever you said, like you're, you're acknowledging I'm weak in this moment Yeah, and I'm going to make it known and I'm asking for help. Just even that alone right. is, is giving you, is, is leaning into that power. That's right. That's, that's such a good word. Well, and Paul talks about it in, uh, in second Corinthians 12, man, how, how, when we are weak, we're strong. Now the power of Christ is made perfect in weakness. And I've said it before, man, God is attracted to weakness. And so in moments of temptation, when we go to God and we say, I'm weak, and if you don't show up for me, I'm about to do something really stupid, that's when God shows up. And he empowers you to not do the stupid, sinful thing you're about to do. Hmm. And so I would say out of love for you, man, don't be stupid and ask for help. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Now, one of the other things you talked about was it, that it took you a while to understand adoption, right? right that that right. you're in God's family. Yes. And I think about people who that might be a a concept that's uh, hard for them to, yep. to, to to comprehend. So, can you can you talk about that or explain it more for those that that maybe in some way you're in? Sure. Yeah, I was going to try to explain it in in a little different way, and so uh, I was going to highlight something that Paul says in Galatians four one through seven. You can go study this more on your own time, but but he makes a statement in the passage that Christ redeems us from the law so that we can receive adoption as sons. And the picture that he's painting here is so rich. The language that he uses is so important. The word redeem, it means to release a slave from his or her owner by paying the slave's price. And so if you imagine in the ancient world, somebody going to a slave market and they pick out a slave they want to buy and they pay the price for the slave, not to subject the slave to slavery, but to set the slave free. This is what Jesus Christ has done for us. Okay. When we were slaves to sin, which is ultimately revealed by the law of God, the law shows us our sinfulness, that, that we are sinners and that we are enslaved and that we've all fallen short of God's way of life and that what we deserve for being slaves in that way is death. What Jesus did is he paid the price to set us free. And the price he paid was his own life, right? Jesus died for us and he died instead of us so that we could be free from slavery. And and I love this about Jesus. The, the sacrifice that he made was ultimately not only about justification, as I talked about, but adoption. And so justification, I believe that for the longest time. Uh, the idea that when I prayed and put my faith in Jesus, that God forgave me of all my sins. But the way that I viewed myself is I thought that I was the slave that he had purchased to set free, but then I was just kind of free and on my own. I'm wandering the streets. I'm taking care of myself. I'm, I'm just doing my best to navigate life. But that is not salvation, true salvation, okay? True salvation is justification and adoption, that when I put my faith in Jesus, yes, God justifies me, but in the same moment, he adopts me into his family, and then he pours out on me all the blessings and all the benefits of sonship, that I don't do anything to earn that. I don't work for that. It is given to me as a gift because of what Christ has done for me. And so going back to the ancient world again, another way to think about it, uh, during Paul's time when he wrote the book of Galatians, if a wealthy man had no children, he could actually adopt a servant and make that servant the heir in his family. 
And in the moment of adoption, that servant stopped being a slave and he became a legal son. And as a son, he could then enjoy everything that belonged to his adopted father in the present, knowing that in the future it would belong to him as well. And this is a picture of salvation, that Jesus Christ paid a price to set us free. It was his own life. And after setting us free, God the Father brought us into the family and made us one of his own. And so now we get to enjoy all that belongs to Christ because it's ours as well. And we get to enjoy the benefits of sonship now, and we'll get to enjoy them throughout eternity. And so I would just say, I think one of the reasons that people have such a warped view of God is because they stop short. This is why I had such a warped view of God for a long time. Justification, yes. Adoption, no. I've been set free, yes. I'm in the family, no. And I didn't view God for the longest time as a loving father who wanted what was best for me. I thought of him as the slave master. (laughs) Just, you know, I always had to work to please him and appease him. And he was always waiting in the shadows to strike me down for doing wrong. That is why some of you who are listening are so insecure in your relationship with God right now. That is how you see him. And the only thing that can free you from that insecurity is a full understanding of your salvation. That salvation is justification and adoption. That you have gone from slavery into sonship, from captivity into the family, and that everything that belongs to the Father now belongs to you, and it's all because of Jesus. Mm. Man, if you can understand adoption and the fatherhood of God, it will change everything about your relationship with God. I'm convinced of it. Mm. That's such a beautiful thing. I I remember when a lawyer talked to me about justification, because when I think about that stuff, I think about the courtroom, and and, and she had told me that that in, in a legal sense, justification isn't a, a declaration that you're not guilty. It's actually saying you are guilty. Right. You are guilty, but the the consequence of the punishment is taken care of. That's like that, exactly it. That what happened, there's there's a justification for it, right? Yep. That that it's been it's been handled, it's been taken care that's of. That's right. And so that's it's mercy. Yep. Right. But then the grace, right, the getting what you don't deserve, is the judge then turning around saying, okay, hey, you're guilty, but this has been taken care of because yep. of this justification. But just so we're on the same page and we can help you never let this happen again, I'm now adopting you mm, to yeah. be my child yep, yep. so I can walk with you yep. so we're never have to be here again. It's so good, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I, I do think that's a really important clarification that, that justification does not mean that God simply lets our sin go. Like the only reason that God can declare a sinner not guilty anymore is because Jesus Christ suffered what that sinner owed. Right. That Jesus took care of the penalty. Yeah. The guilt that, was still there. That's it had right. To be dealt with. Yes. That the wage we earned is death, but Jesus Jesus took that for us. Right. And so it's mer- like you said, it's mercy, but at the expense of someone else. Right. That that Jesus substituted himself for right. me and you. Right. He went for us and instead of us. And because Jesus Christ has has suffered our guilt. We can be set free. It's pretty stinking amazing. And yeah. then I love that picture of the judge bringing you into the family because that's yeah. it. Yeah. That's it. The, the God you have offended yes. went to extraordinary lengths to bring you into the family and to give you everything right. that you could never earn, everything you don't deserve. Yeah, this above and beyond extra, why are you doing this thing? Yeah. No, you're now you're now my child. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going to walk with you and make sure that, yeah, it is, yeah it's so good. Um, okay. So how can we tell, we're talking about sin, okay. right? talking about dealing with this, how can we tell when sin is the result of demonic influence, mm-hmm. right? if, we're, if, we're, if we're falling into these traps, or if it's the result of our, our flesh, yeah. right? or is there a difference? Yep, yep. Yeah, I think I know where this question's coming from. You know, over the weekend, uh, I just touched briefly on the school shooting that took place in Nashville back at the beginning of last week which is horrific and heartbreaking yeah, and, and disgusting. And we need to be praying for all parties involved. And man, it's just such a tragic situation. I, I, I can't fathom, but I, I did say in the sermon that I am of the belief that it was satanic or demonic influence mm. that caused that woman to do what she did. Um, walking into a school and murdering innocent children in cold blood. I don't know any other way to explain that. Like I, I know we can throw around certain things like emotional disorders or mental illness and and maybe there's some of that going on, 
But any person who can murder a child like she did, I believe is under the influence of demonic or satanic oppression, okay? Um, So the question is, how do we know the difference between, okay, is it my flesh, that part of me that's just always working to drag me away from God and towards sin, or is there something greater going on underneath that? And and the first thing I would say is we have to remember that these things are related in a sense, all right? We just read this book, and I think we've talked about it on the podcast before, right? Yeah, a lot, actually. Okay, a lot. <laughs> if you haven't read the book Live No Lies by John Don't Mark Homer, you need to buy it on Amazon and read it. That's it's right. a great book, but we just read it with our staff, and he talks about uh, the flesh, the devil, and the world, mm-hmm. and how these things are connected. And he talks about how we all have disordered desires. This is the flesh we're broken sinners. And so there's, there's aspects of it. We, we just want to do things we don't need to be doing. And we don't want to do things that we need to be doing. That's the flesh. And he talks about how the devil's number one strategy is lies, that he lies to us to get us to indulge those disordered desires. And then he normalizes them in a fallen world to convince us that it's all fine, that it's okay. That if we indulge those desires, uh, we're going to know the good life. We're going to know joy in life. And so again, if you haven't read that book, then, then go read it. But all that to say this, um, nobody can excuse their behavior by simply blaming it on the devil. Hmm. Okay. Like I've heard that all oh, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil can't make you do anything. Okay. I mean, the devil can, can tempt you. He can persuade you. He can oppress you. He can influence you. Um, but, but the devil, what we have to remember is that he is not omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere at all times. Um, he's a created being. And so he can only be in one place at one time. But he does have a force of, 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 uh, of demons that are working in partnership with him, an army of demons working in partnership with him. And again, they can oppress, they can influence, they can even possess people. And uh, possession, this is a whole nother conversation. I don't know that we got time to get into demon possession today, but, uh, but I would say this, the devil's not hiding under every single rock. So we can't blame everything that we do on him. Mm. How, how do we know the difference? How do we know if it is him or if it is demonic oppression or possession? This is where I think we have to be really in tune with the spirit of God. Okay. And, and track with what I'm saying here for a moment. When you read the gospels, Jesus somehow knew the difference. So he would encounter people at times who were sick or who were crippled or who were possessed. And somehow in the moments, Jesus knew like, okay, what they're experiencing, demonic. What they're experiencing, the result of living in a fallen, broken world. And he was able to discern in moments how to interact with people based on what he could see. And so I think, again, if we are going to discern between the two, how do we know when sin is the result of demonic influence? Again, I'm staying away from possession language today, but demonic influence rather than the flesh, I think this is where we have to be very intentional about walking in step with the spirit of God to know. I think we have to really lean into him to know the spiritual nature of what we're doing, the spiritual nature of what other people are doing, because if we don't know, we don't know how to serve people. Um, I'll just say it like this. There might be something or someone suffering in a physical way and it is demonic in nature and you're trying to address it in a physical way when really you need to be addressing it in a spiritual way. Mm. Or somebody's doing something as, as a result of what the flesh is causing them to do and you're like trying to pray a demon out and it's like, nah, bro, that ain't, that's just them. Like you just need to tell them to quit being an idiot and to walk in the power of the spirit and to put that thing to death. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so we need wisdom and discernment to know and I believe that comes from the spirit of God. I'll say it like this. We need to ask God to give us eyes to see. Mm-hmm. What's behind that? What is underneath that? What would cause a person to do something like that? And I think in certain cases, there are sins that are, so, are, that are so severe that it's plain and obvious. Mm. That's where I would go back to the school shooting. I think it's plain and obvious to see what she did. I don't know if you've watched the videos of uh, the body cam videos that were released. It's horrific. And I'm, I'm telling you, man, just when I watched those videos, I just had this great sense. Like that's demonic in nature. That is satanic in nature. She mm. possessed by something. I have no idea. Yeah. 
But at the very least, I do believe that that there was demonic oppression taking place there. Mm. I, I don't know any other way to explain mm. that. Well, I think it's a, you make a distinction between possession and influence, and I think that's important because yeah. when we talk about demons, I think that's the that's the where everybody goes. Like, oh, I don't have a demon in me. It's like, yeah, but right, you might have right, a demon right, right. whispering in your ear. Correct. And that's the th one of the things that John Mark Comer talks about in his book. That this is a battle. This is war. Absolutely. One of our elders, Michael Pauk, we were talking about this very thing and, and that distinguishing between whether it's some evil force in the unseen realm whispering in your ear or nudging you. And I'm just think about like what that could be uh, stuff that you're that you're choosing to watch online or, mm -hmm. or, or listen to or read or whatever that is. Like you're just allowing things to yeah. influence you. Right. Um, or or that that there is this this internal desire to please yourself, yeah, right? Uh, which is different than just the, the the ugliness of the broken world. That's right. And identifying those things, this is what Michael Puck was talking about, like from a, because from a, he's a Marine, yep. from a military standpoint, identifying what the what's actually happening to you yep. is ultimately how you determine the defense yep. against it. Is right. this something whispering in my ear? Is this something I desire for myself? Is this something in the broken world? Knowing the difference between those things is important so you can say, stop, I'm not doing that. Stop yep. talking yep. to me. I'm going to turn this off. Right. Or that's not holy. That is not, that's for me. That's not for God. I got to stop that. Yeah. Or the world is broken. Look at this. This is why we need a savior. And, and so you can build proper defenses up mm -hmm. against that. And, and, and I think it's also important that, that people get the distinction between, I don't think about movies and don't think about possession, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Because we, I mean, we see that in scripture, we know that's a real thing, but, but that you can be influenced Correct. towards evil. Correct. And that's what you're talking about. Absolutely. Not that whatever was going on, but that there was influence yeah. that was evil yep. that that got to her and pushed her in that direction. That's right. Um, and it, yeah, just making that distinction is is uh, is so key, I yeah, think. Yeah. And, and knowing how to truly have a defense against those things, um, whether it is something influencing you, whether it is your selfish desire, yeah. whether it's just knowing the world is important for truly distinguishing between and then having a good defense yeah. against it. Well, I mean, here's the deal, man. At the end of the day, we either believe this stuff is real or we don't. Right. Yeah. And I think one of the greatest lies of the enemy that he wants us to believe is that none of it's real. Right. Because if we believe that he's not real and that his demonic forces are not real, then we turn a blind eye to them and they have a heyday, right? In, yeah. in our lives and in our world. But if we believe that it's real, we need to ask God to give us eyes to see so that we know how to go to battle. We know what we're warring right. against and we know how to serve people that are dealing with these things. Right. And so it is real. I mean, we see it all throughout the Bible, all throughout the gospels. Jesus knew it was real. He confronted it in very, very aggressive ways. And I think that when we see it, we have to be willing to call it out for what it is. Right. Because if we do not call it out for what it is, and all we do is chalk it up to natural things or worldly things, then we just give the enemy more of a foothold in our lives. And we don't have time for that. Yeah. We cannot afford that. As I said over the weekend, he's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's a roaring lion looking for people to devour. And if you don't believe he's real and that's not who he is, he's going to invade your life and he's going to murder things. <laughs> right. And so you got to wake up, man. Yeah. Ask God to give you eyes to see. Yeah. And like you said, be, be in prayer, be in the word, like be fasting. You, you have the right weapons yep. to have the right defense. That's exactly right. Yeah. And don't play around with darkness. Mm. Do not play around with darkness because... If you do, you can open yourself up to the enemy very easily and not even know it. And not even know it. Yep. Man, that's good. All right, that's a good, that's a good place. That's a good place to wrap it up today. So thanks for listening. If you have any questions about the sermon or about scriptures or faith in general, please send them to us by email or DMing us on social sites or text the word question to the number 22722. Thank you for listening to The Pursuit. For more information about our church or this podcast, please visit crosspointcity.com or follow us on your favorite social media platforms. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider subscribing, leaving a five-star review, and sharing it with a friend. No matter what, we want you to know that we love you, we're here for you, and we'll see you next week.